So the first two verses, 2 Kings 5, I'm going to read out of the Good News Bible. And it says, Naaman, the commander of the Syrian army, was highly respected and esteemed by the king of Syria. Because through Naaman, the Lord had given victory to the Syrian forces. He was a great soldier, but he suffered from a dreaded skin disease. In one of the raids against Israel, the Syrians had carried off a little Israelite girl who became a servant of Naaman's wife. Story about a man named Naaman, commander, it says, of the Syrian army. Many of our translations use other words like Aram. I read Aram and that didn't ring a bell with me. I read Syria and that rang a bell. Whatever's old is new. When I thought about Syria, modern day Syria, and I'm thinking about all the horrible atrocities that we read about and see in the news and the, the horrible civil war, and that region, that region is the focus of what we're reading here this morning. That region many, many years ago. So we're reading about a man by the name of Naaman. And he is well described for us in these first two verses. In fact, if we were to summarize the kind of man that he was, we might say that he was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the day. Because he was that important. Very, very important man. When I think about someone of great importance, cannot help but think about the past week and think about the state funeral for Senator John McCain. And uh, I followed that with a great deal of interest. A remarkable, remarkable honoring of this man. And uh, afforded a state funeral comparable to that that presidents have. And so I think about a, a great man, a contemporary man, and I think about Naaman being a very important great man, much like that. It says that he was captain of the army of the king that he was a, a great man with his master, that he was highly respected, that he was a valiant warrior. Tremendously descriptive phrases that give us the idea Naaman was a very, very important man. And a phrase that I read that kind of gives me a, a pause and troubles me just a little bit, it says that by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. I like to think that God fights the battles on behalf of Israel, but maybe we don't always understand how God works. That somehow the Lord God has been working through this man Naaman and has given victory to Syria, even apparently over the nation of Israel, God's chosen. All these great things said about Naaman, but, but then there's that but. But, the kicker. As great a man as he was, it says that he had this horrible skin disease that's called leprosy. So in spite of all of his great accomplishments, in spite of all of his greatness, there was a painful reminder for Naaman every time he looked in the mirror, literally. Leprosy was indeed a horrible skin disease, not so much of a big deal today, but it was pretty much a death sentence back in those days if you had it. It would start out as a small spot on your skin. Just a little blemish, not a big deal. But it's something working inside the body. And it literally would invade the body. It eventually would lead to death because in Naaman's day, and indeed even in Jesus' day, there was no cure for leprosy. Leprosy would deaden nerves. That was a part of the problem with the disease. So because of the fact that it would deaden nerves, then toes and fingers and limbs could be injured, and the person that had the disease wouldn't necessarily know it. And so toes and fingers and limbs would become infected. In many cases, they literally would fall off or would be amputated. Again, there was no cure for leprosy. I want you to hold on to this thought because this is where the story is going to get very practical for us as we consider it today. Leprosy that Naaman had is a picture of sin that we all have. 
thinking about leprosy. As it said, it was deadly. Well, so was sin. Leprosy would deaden nerves. You know what? Sin does that to us spiritually. It deadens our spiritual sensitivity if something's not done about it. Leprosy causes one to be isolated because of the fact that leprosy was so very contagious. People that had it lived in leper colonies. They lived together. Those that had the disease, they were away from everyone else. You know what? Sin kind of works that way too. It isolates us. And it was no respecter of persons. Again, Naaman, a very, very important individual, but he's got this lowly skin disease, this leprosy. And you know what? Sin's the same way. Sin is no respecter of persons. doesn't matter how important or insignificant we are in the world. Sin is the common disease that everyone shares. Ephesians 2 verse 12 talks about our pre-conversion condition, which says you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That is a description of what we might call spiritual leprosy. Every human being has been infected with it. Again, we read the story about Naaman here, and his condition sounds pretty much hopeless, because once you got leprosy, that was it. It ultimately is going to lead to death. So it sounds like a hopeless story that we're reading, except there is the mention right away in verse 2 of this little Israeli slave girl taken captive, who it says was serving Naaman's wife. So verse 3, this little girl says to her mistress, I wish that my master were with the prophet who was in Samaria. Then he would cure him of his leprosy. So this little slave girl, kind of insignificant in the scheme of things, She's in the household of a very important, powerful man, an insignificant little slave girl, notices the skin disease of the, of the head of the house, and just comments that, ah, if he could just know this prophet who's in Samaria, linger over Samaria. In fact, there's a thread and there's a theme that runs throughout this story that's important to pick up on. It is the thread of humility and lowliness. We start off with, again, a very, very important man, but there's so much that he has to learn about humility and lowliness. There's the mention of this lowly servant girl. There's the mention of a prophet in Samaria. If you know anything about Samaria, that was the ultimate outcast culture. Nobody wanted to go to Samaria. And there's so much more that Naaman has to learn about humility as we read the rest of the story. So verse 4 says that Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus spoke the girl who is from the land of Israel. Then the king of Aram, or Syria, said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. He departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand shekels of gold and ten changes of clothes. He brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, And now as this letter comes to you, behold, I have sent Naaman, my servant, to you, that you may cure him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man is sending word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? But consider now and see how he is seeking a quarrel against me. So we get an idea, of, again, of how important Naaman is. His boss is none other than the king. And so the king says, I'll write a letter. We'll send that over to the king of Israel. And we'll get this thing taken care of. And you see the response of the king of Israel. Uh, he doesn't know what to do. Uh, am, am I in the position of God that I can cure this man of leprosy? And so he is literally beside himself. Verse 8 says that it happened when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent word to the king saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Now let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So verse 9 says that Naaman came with his horses and his chariots, 
and stood at the doorway of the house of Elisha. Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh will be restored to you, and you will be clean. But Naaman was furious and went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Phar... I, I hate pronouncing these words. Anyway, these rivers of Damascus, are they not better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned away and went away in a rage. So you picture the story. Again, I keep emphasizing it, but don't miss the point. Naaman is a very important individual. Commander in chief, so to speak, over the, of the armies, of the king. A very important individual. He's told to go off by this little slave girl to, to this despised land of Syria. He goes to a rather insignificant house whereby is living a prophet named Elisha. And so here, here he is humbling himself at least to go there. And I'm sure he expects the prophet would surely come out and talk directly with a man as important as Naaman. But as you read the story, you see what Elisha does. He stays in the house sends out his messenger, his servant, to this very important man and gives him some direction in what he's supposed to do. He's supposed to go wash himself seven times in the dirty Jordan River. And Naaman, as it says here, is furious. He went away in a rage. And I'm guessing it's not a good idea to get an important military man upset like that. But nevertheless, that's his response to this outrageous scene that's just taken place. So verse 13 says, Then his servants, Naaman's servants, came near and spoke to him and said, My father had the prophet told you to do some great thing. Would you not have done it? How much more than when he says to you, Wash and be clean. So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Exactly what Elisha told him to do. Go down, immerse yourself, dunk yourself seven times in the Jordan River. Somebody else preached a message on this particular text and gave it the title, Seven ducks in a dirty river. Think about that for a little bit. And you'll get the idea of why they gave it that title. So verse 15. I guess that was kind of weak, wasn't it? Verse 15. When he returned to the man of God with all his company and came and stood before him, he said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. So please take a present from your servant now. But he said, as the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will take nothing. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. Naaman said, if not, please let your servant at least be given two mules load of earth. For your servant will no longer offer burnt offering, nor will he sacrifice to other gods, but to the Lord. In this matter, may the Lord pardon your servant when my master goes into the house of Rimmon to worship there. And he leans on my hand, and I bow myself to the house of Rimmon. When I bow myself in the house of Rimmon, may the Lord pardon your servant in this matter. And he said to him, Go in peace. So he departed from him some distance. Naaman was a changed man. Because of what God had done in his life, he was immensely grateful. He wanted to do something very generous. And perhaps more importantly, he no longer wanted to worship in the way that he had before. You read this mention of two mules load of earth and may wonder what's that all about. Literally, because of the change in his life, Naaman wanted to worship on different ground. It's a great story. It's a great, wonderful story about humility, about faith, about obedience about conversion, and about change. I wanted to share this story with you today because it's a story about salvation. 
it has a very rich and important application for each of us. One of the key lessons we've already touched upon, and that is the fact that every single human being has an infectious disease. As we said, that disease is called sin, which again is no respecter of persons. It does not matter how important we are, how insignificant we are in the world, we've got it, we're infected. Sin is an internal problem, but it very often manifests itself in external ways. We take a look in the mirror, maybe first thing in the morning. We look at ourselves in the mirror and we don't see a skin disease like leprosy, but how often do we look in the mirror and have a sense that there's just something wrong with us? I know that's often my experience. Look in the mirror and not entirely satisfied with what we see. There's, there's some problem that needs to be hidden. There's some hurt that needs to be healed. And I think that the very first sin resulted in a great deep awareness that there was something wrong and Adam and Eve tried to cover up that wrongness. You're probably familiar with Genesis 3, 7. It says that the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. It wasn't about being physically naked. Sin gave them a great awareness that there was something wrong. They were now infected with this, this disease. And it created a great awareness of something that was wrong with them. With Naaman, it was pretty obvious that he had something wrong with him. The cure for our problem, like the cure for Naaman, is a faith dunk in some water. And so I think what he was called to do is a type of baptism. And so it wasn't exactly baptism that Naaman was involved in, but it certainly represents the solution to the problem of the, the disease that we all have of sin. Baptism is the way to be made clean. I like 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. I shared it a few weeks ago when we had a baptism on Sunday. Because I think this speaks so well to what baptism is. It says, Baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Such a good reminder. Baptism's not a bath. It's not about washing something off of our flesh. No, baptism is literally an appeal to God to have a pure, clean conscience and that being done through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Baptism means nothing without the sacrifice and the resurrection of Christ. But that's exactly what it is. It's appealing to God, I want to be new. I want to be clean. I want to be cured of the disease that I have. A dip in a dirty river was a reminder to Naaman that it's really not about the quality of water, but it's about the step of faith and the step of obedience. If it's really about the water, he wanted a, a pure river to be dipped into. If it's really about the water, I was thinking, then we probably ought to fill the baptistry when we have a baptism. We ought to be filling it with distilled water. It ought to be just pure water, if that's what it's about. How ridiculous, how absurd. It's the symbolism. It's not about the water. The priority must be upon doing things God's way according to his very clear command. For Naaman, it was something that he absolutely did not want to do, dipping himself seven different times in a dirty river. We know that there's significance with number seven, don't we? Seven's always associated with God. I think about, well, what if Naaman had decided to dip himself six times? Hey, this ought to be enough. Or what if he'd have decided to dip himself eight times? You know, if seven's good, well, one more is even better. Now, the key, as you know, was the specific obedience, what God said God wanted. Seven times means seven times doing exactly as God had commanded, dipped into the water. I don't especially want to belabor the point about baptism by immersion, but while I have a few minutes... It is clearly the mode time and time again in the Bible if you're going to get baptized. There are some later church traditions that changed immersion to pouring and to sprinkling, and maybe there's a few other modes and methods as well. 
And I'm here before you to state that I don't necessarily agree or believe that it's going to cost somebody life in the coming kingdom because they were baptized by the wrong mode. But I think this question needs to be raised, and that is, why do something that is not clearly commanded in Scripture? I think we want to do it just right according to what God says. If time and time again the way to be baptized is to be immersed, I sure wouldn't want to put it on the line by doing something else. I think that the miracle is to be found in precise obedience. That was the miracle with Naaman. That's the miracle of baptism. If we are told to, to be baptized in faith, in repentance, in the name of Jesus Christ, and, and it's clearly mentioned in Scripture that people who did it were immersed, then that's what I want to do. That's what I chose to do in 1973. I think that we want to be as precise in obeying the commands of God as we possibly can. Acts 2.38 is a verse we lift up so often, but it's so important. Repent, and each of you be baptized, immersed in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In essence, you will be cured of your infectious disease once and for all. Cured and given power to overcome that disease forever from that point on. It's an important step of obedience. Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16, what we call the great commission of Jesus, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. And he who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. It's laid out pretty clearly and precisely. It weighs on us for what we're to do. We're the ones who've been cured of the infectious disease, we're the ones to go out into the world and to declare the gospel to all of the creation. And the response of those who hear it is that those who come in faith are baptized and indeed are saved. Those who have refused faith, and I would say also baptism, are condemned. Back to our story. Like Naaman, each of us need to live a changed life after God's miraculous cleansing. He lived a different life after he was changed by dipping himself down in the river. We need and are called to live a different life after God's great miraculous cleansing in the waters of baptism. Naaman, we're told here, wanted to respond in generosity to God's gift. He also wanted to worship on new ground. That certainly fits each one of us post our conversion. We go down into the waters of baptism to receive the help that we so desperately need as Naaman so desperately wanted a solution and a miracle. That's why we go down also into the water is to receive the help that we so desperately need. We come out of the water ready to give, ready to serve, ready to worship in response to God's wonderful, miraculous grace in our lives. It is God's design for each of us that we bear the fruit of new life in light of God's great miracle in our lives. We need to be generous like Naaman. Generous not just with things, not just with what we put in the offering plate, what we give to help those that have needs. We need to be generous in those ways, certainly, but we need to be generous with testimony. We need to be generous with the gospel. We need to see the other Naamans around us who desperately need a saving change. You know, when I think of this story in 2 Kings 5, I believe that the real hero of the story is not so much Naaman. It's that unnamed little Jewish slave girl who told Naaman how to receive God's help and God's gift. That's the picture, the example for us. The example of outreach, the example of evangelism, that we need after our Naaman kind of conversion, we need to be like the little girl that's telling others who so desperately need help how to find God's gift. I was thinking about a little half sheet of paper that I shared, I guess, a couple of months ago. I still have mine. I sure hope that you do. If you don't, there's several copies out there on the Narthex table. This is an ever-increasing burden. Opportunities for impact. Y'all remember that? 
an opportunity in particular to list four names of individuals who desperately need a miracle from God, namely salvation. People who right now are lost with their infectious sin disease. I think about the names often. I pray about them. I seek opportunities to build bridges to those individuals. And there's one name that stands, I'm not going to tell you the name, but there's one name that stands out on my list. One of my neighbors. And from time to time I've had opportunity to talk about spiritual matters and I'm excited about the possibilities that continue to develop in conversation with that man. We all have been Naamans who've been washed and cleansed and cured of our disease and we need to be, need to be like the little slave girl telling others how to receive a miracle from God. That's one of the changes that the, that the Lord wants from us post-conversion. The other is that of worshiping on new ground. It is a challenge for each of us to consider whether we have truly parted ways with our deadly past lifestyle. That's not so easily done, but it's so very, very important for us to do. It is not enough for us to just clean up our old self. We literally have to crucify our old self in the waters of baptism so that Christ can live in us and work through us. Our motto must be Galatians 2.20. The Apostle Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me and the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Indeed, if we are in Christ, I pray that everyone in this room is, if we are in Christ, meaning that we have been born again through faith, through repentance, through baptism, through a renewed spirit-filled life, we need to closely identify with the little slave girl in the story. We need to be telling those infected by sin how to be cleansed and healed and renewed. If we are without Christ, like Naaman in the story, that we've never made a decision to fully respond to the command of God and the word of God, like Naaman, we are desperate for help whether we know it or not. The problem with sin is, as we mentioned, it can harden our hearts. We may not know how bad off we are because sin will dull our senses, giving us a sense that everything's all right. I got all the goods in the world and the, the, the good life in the world and not even knowing how desperate our condition is. We need to take a good look at where we stand <clears throat> with God. In fact, I would say we need to dare ask and pray this. God, are things okay between us? It's a risky question in prayer but one every one of us needs to ask. God, are things okay between us? Am I at peace with you through your Son, Jesus Christ? Have I fully obeyed that which I've been commanded by you to do? And I leave us each with those searching questions today.